Hello everyone and welcome to this Water Institute sponsored event. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Mike Patterson, who is Senior Fellow and Research Associate at the International Institute for Sustainable Development and former section lead at the Experimental Lakes Area for the ELA. Oh, come on in. Have a seat. Uh, you pretty much have to have been living under a rock, I think, not to have heard of the ELA. Uh, since May 2012, when the federal government announced that they would be stopping funding to the experimental lakes area, it's been in the media pretty much constantly. In fact, I looked it up and there have been over 500 news articles published on ELA just in the last year and a half. Uh, everyone is talking about it, from Rick Mercer to uh, nature and science. Uh, everyone is talking about ELA's legacy and how the impact of research done there has influenced national and international policy, and also uh, what it signals uh, in terms of science and the environment in Canada that the federal government has sort of washed its hands of the ELA. And Dr. Patterson has something to say on those subjects. He uh, carried out research at the ELA for 21 years, and in that capacity, uh, he was part of high-profile, team-based research on policy-relevant environmental issues. He contributed to topics like mercury contamination, nutrient pollution, uh, hydroelectric reservoir development, invasive species, and freshwater fish farming, so a really broad suite of hot topics in the environment and in water. When I was pursuing my master's at the Experimental Lakes area, Dr. Patterson was a mentor to me and to all the graduate students, uh, and he was always ready to help with whatever you needed, whether that was some insight into the planktonic community or the one time that he caught me at the lake after dark without a flashlight, a spare headlamp, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, no, he, he was always willing to help, always ready and eager to help. Uh, when the federal government decided or announced that they would stop funding the Experimental Lakes area, the International Institute for Sustainable Development really stepped up. And with assistance from the Ontario government, from the Manitoba, they're taking on management of the Experimental Lakes area. And Dr. Patterson really stepped up as well. Uh, he took a job at IISD and is serving as a sort of interim director for ELA, helping to work towards transitioning ELA to the IISD. And that is what he's here to speak with us about today. So without further ado, we will join you in welcoming Dr. McCann. Thanks. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and have a chance to talk about ELA, and thank you, Rebecca, for your, your comments. It's always embarrassing to hear about yourself. Uh, <laughs> um, figure out how to move things forward here. I, I've, uh, until uh, about four months ago, I, I was still working with DFO and with the Experimental Lakes area, and so I wasn't really in a position to speak publicly about ELA. But over the last... Uh, last few months I've gotten out and started talking to people and I realized that there's a wide range of backgrounds about ELA. Every, many, many people I've talked to actually haven't heard about ELA. I guess they're living under a rock by uh, Rebecca's definition. <laughs> so on the other end of the spectrum I'm talking to people like Sherry and Rebecca uh, and Richard and J uh, Jason. Uh, there's all sorts of people here who've worked at ELA for decades and know every uh, bit about it. So for those people I'm going to apologize in advance because th my talk today is fairly basic. All I, my, my goal was to uh, talk to you about ELA, what it is that we have done, uh, why it's important to save, and what we, where we're, we are with uh, moving forward and what we hope ELA will look like in the future. And, and, I, and at the end, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions about uh, the directions we're taking and suggestions. So for those of you that don't know about ELA, uh, it, it is a whole ecosystem aquatic research program that's been operated by the Government of Canada, specifically Fisheries and Oceans, or DFO, uh, since 1968. And uh, as Rebecca already mentioned, uh, about a year and a half ago now, in May of 2012, the government announced that it was no longer going to fund ELA. Uh, and this led to considerable outcry in both the scientific press and in the public press. Uh, there was a lot of uh, upset about the closure, which I have to say, as, a, as an ELA researcher, I was really taken ba aback by. I thought we would be a little story in the back page of uh, the Winnipeg Free Press, and that would be the end of it. And, and in response to that outcry, the government indicated that it was willing to transfer 
the assets, as they call it, of ELA, uh, to uh, an independent operation that was self-funded. And after waiting a little bit to see whether, in the hope that the government would reverse this decision, uh, I went out and tried to basically go through what I thought was the only door left open to us and try to find a way to fund uh, ELA independently and to get an independent ELA up and, up and going. And it was through my discussions with people, I started out just basically having coffee with anybody that would talk to me about ways to do this, and it was through discussions with people with RBC Blue Water Foundation that they suggested I talk to the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and I'll tell you more about them later. And they expressed a willingness and, and an interest in becoming involved with the LA, and that has now evolved to the point where it looks like a transfer will happen, hopefully in the next uh, month and a half. It, this should be done, and I'll, I'll get to this later. A and that transfer would include uh, the ELA facility and a substantial proportion of the uh, current staff, I hope. So the goals of research at ELA ha have always been, and I hope and I think will continue to be going forward, to better understand national and international threats to the environment, and, and especially fresh water. Although, as I'm going to talk about more later, I think there's now an opportunity to expand the kinds of research we do beyond freshwater. But traditionally, we have always been primarily a freshwater research facility. The goal of the research was to come up with solutions to environmental problems. And I think, as, and I'll show you many examples, uh, I think we've been very successful at doing that. And the idea was to give advice in the past to the federal government about how to deal with environmental issues and to provide scientific basis for informed decision making. So I'm going to start by just talking about the facility because that of course is at the heart of all this. And this is an aerial shot uh, of, the, of the camp. There's about 20 buildings there. We can comfortably sleep about 60 people. We have had as many as 100 in camp. Um, there's kitchen, labs, workshop. There's a fully functioning uh, meteorological station or MET site. Uh, which Environment Canada has indicated they, won't, they will continue to operate at ELA. And anybody that's been there will tell you that it is one of the best field research facilities anywhere in the world. And this is just some more pictures. It started, Sherry's probably, and maybe me, uh, are probably the only people that remember it at the beginning, but it was just a collection of aqua trailers in the middle of the bush. And while we have struggled for a long time, certainly my entire time at ELA for funding, we, the government has been very good about investing money into infrastructure. A and uh, we have new dorms that were put in a few years ago. Brand new fish lab opened, ironically, about six months before they announced the, clo the closure uh, at a cost of like $1.2 or, $1 or $3 million. Um, these are, this is a picture of the labs. It's a great facility, and it's just, it, it's, uh, uh, really, I, I don't think there's anywhere else that can quite uh, compare with it. And it's located, I did forget to mention, that it, it's very remotely located. It's a, at the end of, it's about a four hour drive e east of Winnipeg. It's in Ontario. It's about halfway between Kenora and Dryden and it's down, a, it's about a 45 minute drive down an old logging road. And there's, uh, it's about an hour and a half to the nearest town. So there is really no other human activity in the area and these lakes are very remote and they're very pristine. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that ELA is much more than a collection of, book, of buildings in the bush. A and when we first started having discussions uh, about ELA with DFO and ISD and things like that, DFO really pitched it as, I, I think one of my managers said, there's nothing different between this and transferring a lighthouse. Uh, it is very different, and I, and I hope to convince you of that today. Um, it, it, it's a research program, it's a research facility, it's a science program that is intimately connected to its staff uh, and to the people that work there, including all the, the, the research that's done by university collaborators and the like. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that uh, ELA does what it does because of the contribution of all these people. And this is just the, the, a subset uh, shown in, in, this, in this picture. And it includes the, the official DFO staff, former DFO staff, I guess, going forward. It includes university collaborators, people from government agencies, and many, many, many students that have, have worked at the facility. There's an enormous amount of corporate knowledge and memory about how to do whole ecosystem research and whole ecosystem manipulations that, that resides with those individuals. 
And this is, I just want to emphasize that we have a long history of partnering with universities and with government agencies and with industry in the past. Essentially, DFO paid our salaries and for the facility, but we raised the research dollars externally. And there's no way that this small group of people at ELA by themselves could do all the work uh, that's done there. So we rely very heavily on this partnering model uh, in the past. So I want to spend uh, the next uh, 20 minutes or so talking about why I think ELA is so important to save and why it's unique. And there's really, uh, aside from the team and the facility, which are all excellent, there are many field stations around. Uh, the two things that really stand out to me about ELA as being crucial and the reasons why it must be saved, in my view, are the ability to conduct whole ecosystem experiments and our, our long-term data set. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes just sort of talking about whole ecosystem experimentation and, and uh, it, its importance. And I'm going to start with one of the oldest whole lake experiments at ELA. Uh, it's one of the more famous ones, but most importantly, it's also one of the most visual. If, the truth is, is that most of many of the experiments that we conduct at ELA, when you manipulate a lake, it, it ends up looking no different than it did before. If you add mercury to a lake, it doesn't really visually look different. These lakes look very different. So the idea of what we do is we'll take usually small lakes and study them for a few years in their natural state to get a, a sense of natural variability. And then we manipulate them in different ways, uh, usually with the goal of, of mimicking human activities. Uh, and in the case of the, this study, uh, the interest and the concerns at the time were about eutrophication or excessive algal growth in lakes and about what were the most important nutrients that caused eutrophication and consequently which were the most important nutrients for society to manage going forward. And the debate was about, at that time, was primarily about carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus and there was a whole series of whole lake experiments done at ELA to look at the relative importance of those different nutrients. This is a double basin lake, Lake 2 to 6. Uh, and it was divided in half by a plastic curtain and this basin received carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus and this basin received carbon and nitrogen. And it's immediately evident that the side that received phosphorus turned bright green. This is an overhead view of the curtain. Uh, and the side that did not receive phosphorus and received carbon and nitrogen stayed relatively clear. And this provided very strong support for legislation which is now enacted around the world to limit phosphorus inputs to lakes. And uh, it's, this one's very nice too because it's very easy to show a picture like this to a policymaker and say, what do you want your lake to look like? Do you want it to be bright green like this or do you want it to be clear? <laughs> they can understand without any fancy graphs, models or anything else that reducing phosphorus is, is going to help you to achieve your goal. And the other thing I want to emphasize, and this will be a, a theme that I have throughout uh, my talk is that small scale studies done at the, the time that this experiment was done, things like uh, algal bioassays, indicated that carbon was frequently the most important nutrient to, uh, to limit. A and uh, th this, this study showed clearly th these are some of the lowest carbon lakes in the world. If you were ever going to have a carbon problem, it would be here at ELA. And despite that, we were able to turn with the Royal We before I got there. <laughs> uh, it, we were able to turn those lakes green uh, with, with simply additions of phosphorus. Um, and, and, uh, and, and basically what I'm saying is the results of those small scale studies did not extrapolate well at the whole ecosystem scale. And, and this is a consistent result that we've seen in all of the experiments we've done there. It's predictions based on small scales relatively, most of the time or frequently do not work at the whole ecosystem scale. So since those early experiments on eutrophication, and ELA was originally created to address eutrophication issues, we've now completed over 50 whole ecosystem experiments at ELA. And we've looked at a wide range of different issues. After eutrophication, uh, the team at ELA, at that time led by David Schindler, moved on to uh, look at acidification impacts and acidification recovery. But since that time, a whole wide range of different things have been done that have included uh, chemical manipulations, things like additions of cadmium, mercury, uh, endocrine disruptors, and I'll show you some data from those. And also biotic ma manipulations where uh, fish have been moved from lake to lake or an aquaculture study uh, that was done. And also physical manipulations of lakes, things like raising and lowering water levels. And I'll show you some pictures of those. And really the only point I, I want to make with this this particular slide is that there's a lot of different types of issues that can be addressed at ELA. 
And really, you're only limited by, to some degree, your creativity and, and uh, ability to pull some of these off. And, and I'm, the reason I'm here at Waterloo is that I, I would like to talk to potential researchers. I guess what's going to happen with ISD and ELA going forward uh, is that we will be able to host whole ecosystem experimentation on a wide range of issues. And I, and I really want to encourage researchers to start thinking about ways that they might do this kind of research at ELA. In the past, we were always burdened by issues about being a part of the government, about fitting the mandate of DFO and all this sort of stuff. None of that's on the table anymore. So we can do anything that uh, we can get funding for and, and fit with the agreement with Ontario, which I will talk a bit about later, but is, is not, if nothing, it's not sub anything substantially different than what we had in the past. So this is just uh, a, a slide that shows some of the, the reservoir experiments we did at ELA. And we've done a, a number of studies where we've looked at water management, raising and lowering water levels. These, this is an artificial reservoir that, that was created in 1991, and these are some others. Sherry was a big part of the work done here. This is just the little dam we built. And the goal was to try and provide advice primarily to hydro companies about how to manage reservoirs uh, to minimize environmental impacts. And, and at the time, especially mercury and greenhouse gas production, but uh, I've also done some work with nutrients and other things uh, related to water management. And we have another study that I'm not going to show you any pictures of today, but that's going on right now where we're diverting water around the lake to look at the effects of changes in water delivery to a lake that might happen with climate change or with uh, water diversions or bulk water uh, removals. But we've done quite a bit of work on water management. We did a study that got quite a bit of attention looking at the effects of uh, estrogen. There's a, uh, many of you are, I'm sure, aware that many chemicals mimic uh, estrogen. And at the time the study was done, and, uh, there was uh, a, a lot of concern expressed as to whether the, the sorts of assays that groups like the US EPA or Environment Canada were doing uh, to determine the estrogenicity of various compounds uh, had validity in the open environment. Essentially what they would do is they would expose organisms like fathead minnows to a chemical, a new chemical, and they would see whether it expressed a, a protein called vitellogenin. Uh, but, but a number of industry people were saying, well, we don't really know if that has any meaning at, at, in the, at an ecosystem scale uh, with wild populations of fish. And so we added artificial estrogen to a lake for several years, this is Lake 260, and followed what happened in uh, the, the fish and in, in fact the entire uh, food web. Uh, and uh, we also determined the fate, the environmental fate of the, the, these compounds and what happened to them, what do they break down into and how do they transfer throughout the system. Th this slide just shows some of the data from that. It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Uh, and essentially what this is is uh, different years with uh, EE2 additions occurring in 2001, 2, and 3. So it's pre-impact, impact years, and then post-impact. And these are the di different numbers of fish caught in different size categories for the population of fathead minnows. And essentially what you can see is we had a complete population collapse of a year class of minnows with the addition of, of EE2. And, and this provided, again, very strong evidence for uh, regulating or, or being concerned about these chemicals in the open environment. And this is a picture of a, a male uh, fathead with an ovipositor just trying to produce eggs. Uh, so it's an intersex fish that, that was taken from this lake. Uh, we also had a, Rebecca was a big part of this study. <laughs> we also had a study that looked at the effects of aquaculture, which is one of a, a kind of biotic manipulation that we did at ELA. Uh, I'm sure, again, most people here are aware that every major wild fishery in the world is either in a state of decline or is uh, uh, not growing. Uh, and uh, yet 20% of the world's protein comes from fish. And there's, I think it was around 2009 uh, that more farmed fish were sold than wild fish. Uh, so uh, aquaculture is a very major source of, of fish protein in the world. And there's a, a certain amount of pressure in Canada to develop freshwater aquaculture. And even right now, if you go to Safeway, about half of the rainbow trout you buy there is from aquaculture uh, produced fish from Chile. And, and, uh, and yet it's not, this is it's a very small industry right now in Canada, primarily because there's the environmental regulations surrounding it are, are uh, uh, not well developed. And uh, DFO initiated this study with the, the goal of 
uh, trying to develop regulations that would help to ensure, protect both the environment, but also potentially allow this industry to, to move forward. And I'm being assured that that's happening right now. Another study that's got a lot of attention from ELA is the Metallica study. Uh, and here the concern was about mercury in fish. In North America, I think it's about 95% of all the contaminant uh, fish consumption advisories are for mercury. And there are fish consumption advisories for mercury in every state and every province. And if you go to a few places where they have really good data sets, like Ontario, very large proportion of the lakes there have fish cons mercury consumption advisories. I think if in the Ontario Guide for Eating Sport Fish, it's about 85% of the lakes listed there have mercury consumption advisories. And most of those lakes are remote from point source inputs of mercury, and they receive most of their mercury from atmospheric deposition, from rain. And a very large fraction of that mercury is derived from human sources like coal-fired power plants. And so this has led to proposed legislation in both Canada and the United States to force coal-fired coal power plants to put scrubbers on their stacks to remove mercury. But the cost of this is going to be billions of dollars. And, and not surprisingly, the governments and uh, industry want, wanted a clear demonstration that the removal of mercury in rain here will result in a reduction in methyl mercury in fish. And that's the type of mercury that you and I get exposed to. And the main route of exposure of the general public to mercury is through the consumption of fish. And the trouble is, is that when mercury falls on a watershed, there's an enormous number of interactions that happen before it makes its way to the fish. And it's not my intention to go through the arrows on this graph, but just to, to try to emphasize how complicated this is. And there's really no way, in the lab anyway, and, and even with small-scale field studies, it's extremely difficult to establish these links through the whole ecosystem that lead to fish. And even using correlative approaches, like looking at areas where there's different amounts of atmospheric deposition and trying to correlate it with mercury and fish, it's very hard, almost, it's been almost impossible to find patterns because there's an enormous number of factors in the watershed that influence this transfer and create a, a lot of natural vari variability that swamps out relationships in, in uh, these correlative data sets. So what we could do at ELA is do a direct manipulation where we added mercury to the ecosystem and looked at whether it affected mercury in fish. And furthermore, we could gain an enormous amount of information about the mercury cycle uh, so that we could uh, better understand why the sources of variability from system to system. So what we did is we added Stable isotopes of mercury, these are unique forms of mercury that you can distinguish from the, the huge amount of natural or background, it's not really natural necessarily because much of it comes from human sources, but background mercury in the system. So we added these stable isotopes of mercury to the lake and its entire watershed. We used a crop duster airplane to add it to the, uh, the terrestrial system and a boat to add it to the lake itself. And this really provided a direct test of whether there was a demonstrable link between mercury deposition and mercury in fish. And also it provided uh, good evidence about the time scales involved, because it's also important to manage public expectations about how quickly uh, proposed legislation may work or not. Um, and, and to manage industrial uh, industry expectations. And this work was funded by a combination of uh, funding from uh, power companies, EPRI, Environment Canada, US EPA. So I've always been really proud of the fact that this, it was so unique, this study, that we could attract funding from all sides of the issue, because they all recognize that this could not be done anywhere. So we had the power companies and, the, for them, the evil regulators, all working together on this project. A and the results were, were really you know, quite clear, and this hasn't been published yet, but it will be shortly. Parts of it have been. And we started adding, this is the relative increase in methylmercury in different parts of the food web. Uh, this is the, the spike added to the lake itself, because we use different stable isotopes in different parts of the system. And purple is water, uh, zooplankton in green, uh, small fish in red, and bigger fish in, in dark brown. And the essential message is that as we added uh, mercury, it went up in the biota and most importantly the fish. And when we stopped adding mercury, it came down and it provided a very clear link between changes in atmospheric deposition and methylmercury in fish. This is only part of the story because we haven't seen much of the mercury we added to the watershed itself. Uh, so it, it probably will not respond as quickly as this in most systems. Uh, but nonetheless, 
uh, th this provided good, uh, a good support for the proposed uh, mitigation of this in terms of regulation. So I just wanted to, the, the last experiment I was going to talk about was one that hasn't actually happened yet. This is a project that's, that is being led out of Trent University by uh, Chris Metcalf, uh, Maggie Zanopoulos, uh, Paul Frost, and Holger Hintelman. And uh, it was to, the goal of this project was to look at the effects of uh, nanosilver. And the nanoparticle industry is a rapidly growing industry. Uh, there are predictions that it may be worth uh, as much as a trillion dollars in, in a short time. Uh, and one of the most commonly used nanoparticles right now is nanosilver. And it, it's infused in things like underwear, it's in toothbrushes, band-aids, uh, washing machines, all sorts of stuff. And, and yet the, the problem is there's not really a clear understanding of what the environmental fate of, the, of nanosilver is or, or its toxicity. It, it's uh, used in these products as an antibacterial, antifungicidal agent. So it, it's reasonable to expect that it may have consequences for the food web when it hits the open environment. And, and certainly lab studies have suggested that the toxicity of nano silver may vary considerably from straight silver. And, and it's not really known what, the, what, what happens to this stuff uh, chemically or biologically. So the goal was to do a whole lake nano silver addition. It was supposed to start this year. Uh, it didn't. Uh, we did a lot of background work. We've got all the pre impact data. Uh, we did a lot of enclosure studies, uh, which we traditionally do to get an idea of what happens, uh, what, we might ha what we might expect to see at the whole ecosystem scale. And I'm hoping very much that it will happen next year. So there's, notwithstanding the two-year hiatus created by the proposed closure, I'm hoping that lots of great new cutting-edge whole ecosystem studies will continue. So just to sort of wrap up, the, I, I've given the whole ecosystem experiment piece. I've shown you some examples, and, I, and there's lots of others. And some of them, many of them have led to uh, papers in science and nature and things like that, the acidification work uh, and so forth. The, the thing I really just wanted to, to emphasize is that, once again, predictions based on small scale studies have often been proven to fail at the whole ecosystem scale when we do this work at ELA. And, and ultimately, the way that society and you and I interact with, with these environmental problems is at the ecosystem scale. And, and this is the appropriate final stop. And I'm not in any way denigrating the work on small scale stuff. It's really important. But there's a series of steps that leads from small scale to large scale. And to me, the ability to apply experimental techniques at this scale is crucial. And everybody who takes any science course, even in grade five or six, learns about the power of experiments, where you control individual factors one at a time, where you have controls and references against which we, we have a whole suite of reference lakes that are unmanipulated to give us an idea of how lakes would change in the absence of what we do. We, and, and, and we have before and after data. The thing is, is if you, a lot of people said to me, well, why don't you just go and study the lakes that are already polluted? The reason is, is that usually you lack pre-impact data. And generally, when people get on a lake, <laughs> they, they start affecting it in multiple ways. You think of the Great Lakes. They've got introduced species. They've got nutrient problems. They've got contaminants, uh, fishing, all sorts of stuff. And disentangling all of those things is very difficult. These lakes are pristine. They're remote. We can manipulate things one factor at a time and have a better understanding of how these different factors affect the systems. The, probably the single greatest criticism that I, I've encountered about ELA is always that, well, your lake isn't really anything like the lake I'm interested in. That lake is nothing like the Great Lakes. Well, first I would argue that there are basic processes that are common to all lakes. And these lakes, the lakes at ELA are far more realistic and much more similar to the Great Lakes than a, than a test tube. <laughs> and the common processes in these lakes uh, can, and we have shown historically that we can uh, extrapolate from the ELA lakes to other systems. These are the smallest slices of completely functioning independent ecosystems that you can easily work with. And I, I've always likened them to, we use them as model ecosystems in the way that medical researchers use white mice as, a, as an indicator of phy human physiology or engineers use small airplanes in wind tunnels to understand how large airplanes work. They're not identical, but the key to using white mice or using model airplanes is you need appropriate scaling strategies, and we've worked very hard to develop those. And we study all the processes in these lakes 
when we manipulate them that lead to the final results so that when we go to another system, we have a good understanding of when we feel they will apply and not apply. And, and I think if you look at the history of ELA, the results from these manipulations have had tremendous impact on policy and on uh, the science that we do, and that there is a proven ability to extrapolate to other systems. And finally, I know uh, people look at the work at ELA and think it's really expensive. A and I want to emphasize it's not. <laughs> it's, to turn this lake green, that costs 300 bucks a year. <laughs> That's all it costs for phosphoric acid. And it, the lakes are small. They usually, typically, we have a very few number of sampling stations on a lake. They're easily accessible. There are, uh, and uh, compared to working on Lake Winnipeg or the Great Lakes or something, really the work here is very inexpensive uh, and uh, not, uh, and it's very cost effective. And while I have been trying to impress upon you the importance of whole ecosystem work, as I mentioned a minute ago, we also do a lot of work in enclosures. Uh, Many people have called us the enclosure people. <laughs> and, I, and there's a lot, and as I said earlier, there's a lot of information to be gained from uh, these enclosure studies. And, so, and uh, sometimes the enclosure studies are enough, depending on the question of interest. And uh, often they're done in conjunction with a whole ecosystem experiment. For example, this is a study that Diane Oriel and I did where we added mercury at different levels to uh, a whole bunch of 10 meter diameter mesocosms. There's a, I don't know if you can see it down here, there's a, they're quite large. The goal was to expand the, the range of de uh, loading rates from the one we used in the Metallicus project uh, to include more and, and try to put that into a wider range of context. This is, uh, these are smaller enclosures that were being used in the nano silver project. Okay, so. I've spent a large chunk of my talk talking about whole ecosystem experimentation, and really this is what is most crucial about ELA, but the other thing I just want to briefly talk about is the data set. ELA was never created as a monitoring site. It was originally designed to do whole ecosystem experiments primarily to address eutrophication, but we've been around now for 45 years, and we've had uh, we have a, a dedicated team of people working there that are collecting data on everything from meteorology to hydrology, to water chemistry, to every aspect of the food web leading up to fish. And this has now generated undoubtedly one of the largest, most comprehensive freshwater data sets anywhere in the world. And I get requests, or I did when I was still with ELA, in fact I still get them because people keep writing to me about it. Uh, we get requests every couple of weeks for these data because they are so unique and they're incorporated in many, many papers, often with data from other lakes. And this data set has become really, really important for uh, things like climate change. This is a slide showing changes in the number of ice-free days at ELA for addressing the impacts of things like uh, forest fires, natural events like that. And of course, they're crucial for putting the whole lake experiments into a context. Uh, and we primarily, those lakes were initially begun as reference lakes against which to compare the impacts of the whole lake manipulations. And uh, ELA has been successful. It has generated, there's over a thousand peer-reviewed publications that have come out of ELA, published in journals like Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Science. It has led to changes in legislation with respect to nutrients, contaminants, reservoirs, all sorts of different things. And these changes, these legislative changes have affected decisions worth billions of dollars. And many of the scientists at ELA have received national and international attention for the work they did there. Uh, this is the Dave Schindler receiving the first Stockholm Water Prize. I think it's something like uh, five or six uh, ELA scientists have received the Frank Riggler Award, uh, which is the top award for Canadian limnology. And, and they're all good, but it's also because they're associated with the kind of work that we can do here. And as I mentioned earlier, ELA has been a really important place for training. Uh, and there are hundreds and hundreds of students that have gone through ELA, and I think you, my guess is if you go to any major university in Canada, you will find professors that have had training here. You go to any, there's uh, Jason and Rebecca over right here, <laughs> uh, Roland a little bit. <laughs> and there are graduates of ELA that are in uh, uh, consulting firms, government, academia, all over. And uh, of course, many of the universities at ELA uh, are from Ontario. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons I'm here talking about ELA is because I'm hoping uh, that I can convince Waterloo to become more involved with, with ELA going forward, and Waterloo has had a long history of being 
uh, heavily involved with, with research at, at ELA. Okay, so that's kind of the, where we were. And I wanted to just spend uh, the last part of my talk about where we're, where we're going uh, and what our hopes are. Uh, the question I get asked all the time, uh, particularly in the science community, is who, who are the IASD? Why, why, why are they interested in ELA? The International Institute for Sustainable Development is an organization who has its headquarters in Winnipeg. It has offices in uh, Geneva, New York, Ottawa, and uh, now Beijing. And they have been, up till now, a policy research group uh, that did, have not traditionally done hard, any hard science. Uh, they do have a group that, that works with them at the Water Innovation Center. It's a part of the ISD, and they have been concerned about nutrient management and uh, water management issues in the, great, in the Winnipeg, Lake Winnipeg watershed. So they did, have done policy work related to Lake Winnipeg. And their interest in ELA came from the Water Innovation Center. Obviously, water is a key part of sustainable development. It's crucial for drinking water, for crop production, for fishing, for every aspect of life, power, industry. So that they've always had a major focus on water. And I think they've come to the realization that they needed a, a, a stronger basis for their policy advice that was grounded in hard science. And that's where we come in. Uh, and at the same time, from my perspective, I think it's a really interesting uh, opportunity. It's a great opportunity because as a scientist, now that I'm associated with ISD, I, I'm really excited about working with policymakers directly. I, I, I feel like uh, um, uh, economists, social policy people, the kinds of people that, worked at I, that work at ISD right now, it's struck me that we all have the same goals. We just work, we've tended to work in these different silos and we never, we don't speak the same language and I'm working hard to learn their language and hopefully they're working as hard to learn my language. But the, the goal of all the science that, that certainly I've been involved with at ELA and that we've all been involved with at ELA is to make a difference. And now I think this organization, and by working with them, can help to, to do that. And, and I guess uh, I'll say at this time too, that I, the toolbox at, at ELA w was, uh, as a part of fisheries notions, was somewhat limited. Uh, primarily the government thinks in terms of regulation. Uh, we, we will tell industry uh, you can't add more of this chemical or that chemical. And it's mostly focused on things like uh, restricting mercury emissions to the atmosphere or nutrient additions from sewage treatment plants. And that's not to say that that's not important, it is. Uh, but the thing I'm excited about with ISD is they're also interested in uh, more collaborative uh, types of approaches, dealing with communities, with industry, uh, different types of policy approaches that don't, aren't necessarily just top-down regulation. So I found it really exciting to be able to talk to uh, these people about different ways to deal with environmental issues and maybe ones that might be more likely to have a success. I, I think that uh, regulation works well when you have single industries and things like that that you can go to, but many of our environmental issues are complicated, multi-stakeholder. Uh, actually, the Lake Winnipeg watershed is a classic example. Uh, there's many, many different people involved in order to, uh, and uh, really it's very difficult to regulate uh, the Lake Winnipeg watershed. And I think it's, you're gonna have more success working with uh, different levels of government and, and uh, municipalities and so forth and farmers. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm not directly involved with the negotiations, but I'm obviously working closely with those that are. And really good progress has been made. And everybody tells me that they expect the formal deal to be done in the next few weeks. And then it has to be ratified by the board of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And barring uh, some unforeseen disaster, it, it, this is gonna happen. And the transfer is gonna occur. And uh, that transfer should happen within, uh, within a couple of months and hopefully we can start talking about getting people moved over. The, the staff at, at uh, DFO have all received their affected notice or their surplus notices so uh, this is a real concern to me. Uh, we have to start getting uh, the former staff of ELA into the new, the new group. Um, one of the key concerns that has, has been expressed about ELA is, is uh, the agreement. Really the reason that ELA can exist and can do the work that it does is this agreement that has existed between the Canadian government and the, the province of Ontario that allows whole ecosystem experimentation to take place there. And 
uh, all the signals that I've got, and I've been told, I've been assured that a new agreement will be in place, and the appropriate changes in legislation where necessary to allow this to happen will occur, and will occur hopefully by the new field season, so that whole ecosystem experimentation can take place. Uh, right now, no whole ecosystem experimentation can occur because uh, DFO has terminated its agreement with the province of Ontario, and there is no legal basis for doing this. You just can't add stuff to lakes. You, you have to have uh, some support. But this is going to happen. So the, these are the, the, the most important barriers and, and the issues of concern, and uh, they, they look like they will uh, all be gone shortly. So I don't want to deny there's still a lot of challenges. I, I, the goal of, the ultimate goal is to make ELA self-fund, self-sufficient with respect to funding. Right now, Rebecca might be one of the people in this picture. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. Always love this picture because it, it's uh, this is what this is field work for those of you that don't don't know it. Um, I, we I, and most of you probably know that that the province of Ontario has stepped forward and offered funding for the next five years for ELA, and and I will be forever thankful to Premier Wynne because without that support, we were dead. Uh, I mean, and the thing that I have, I've been going out and talking to people for a year and a half about this, and primarily the, the, the pitch that I was trying to make to, to governments was please give us five years to make this happen. Because you just can't take a multi million dollar operation and drop it and say, you know, you guys can take it over tomorrow. But uh, it's like, yeah, and me and what bank? Uh, so uh, I'm very thankful. Uh, for, for the support of the Ontario government, also the Manitoba government, who, is, who have invested uh, resources in this. Uh, but ultimately, the goal is to make ELA financially self-sufficient. And I, as I said earlier, and I want to emphasize again, we do have a long history of doing this. In the past, DFO has primarily funded our salaries, and they've kept the facility going. But the research that we did there by and large, was funded through external grants. And we have worked with a large range of partners. Many of these grants were obtained by researchers in universities, like Waterloo, like Trent, uh, University of Alberta. But we, we also partnered heavily with organizations like uh, EPRI, the US EPA, uh, USGS, uh, Smithsonian, so on and so forth. And so we have a long history of partnering with groups. And I'm confident that we can raise the research dollars. And the only difference is, that now we have to raise our salaries and we have to raise the, uh, the infrastructure costs, which is not trivial, I, I won't deny. And I wanted, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, I think anybody that's been associated with ELA, especially over the last few years, recognizes that, that there have been a lot of limitations to the kinds of research that we could do there. And, and honestly, we've been in kind of a state of decline for quite a while. Uh, and a lot of this had to do with us being part of the government. Uh, we, as a part of DFO, we had to, all of the research done there had, it, had to meet in some way the DFO mandate. And that mandate was fish. And as resources in the government in general got tighter, I increasingly had managers coming to me and saying things like, why are you guys sampling water chemistry? You know, we're the Department of Fisheries. Why are you doing, why are you doing meteorology, things like that? And I, I had to constantly try and justify whole ecosystem work in support of fish. And uh, this, this was really an issue, and, and anybody, and some of you in the room who have been involved with this will know, we've always had to do this sort of weird dance of uh, pounding in uh, the projects that we knew should be done at ELA and could only be done at ELA into the DFO mandate hole, which was often a different shape. <laughs> So I think going, the, the, with ISD, that issue is off the table. We can do whatever the, we can do at ELA and want to do at ELA within the confines of the agreement. And I guess uh, all I should say, the agreement says that lakes, we have to have a high degree of confidence that the lakes will recover. And we can't do anything that represents a threat to human health because these lakes are open to the public if you can get to them. Uh, if you want to hike in and canoe in, you can go there. It's uh, by and large, not many people do. but. Uh, so we can't, but at any rate, we can't do anything that's going to threaten human health. So we, there's things like work on terrestrial systems. Uh, and we have, the agreement allows us to do manipulations in, on land. We just, our team within DFO wasn't constructed in a way that we could do that work. And, and there, we have done some. For example, the Metallica's project had a lot of work done uh, 
uh, on, the, uh, on, on the terrestrial ecosystem by mostly people from the USGS and uh, University of Alberta. Sherry has done work in wetlands and things around ELA, but, but most of the work, by and large, was focused at, at the open water ecosystem. Uh, we can do work on things like biotechnology or, or clean water technology. This, is this was not within our mandate at DFO. Even though we had a group that, this is sort of a picture of some of this, it had, has a lot of experience with remote sampling of lakes and, and uh, automated methods of, this is for measuring ecosystem metabolism and things like that. We can now, I did mention a lot of students have gone through ELA, but as part of DFO we had no formal mandate for training. And so we didn't ever host things like field courses or stuff like that, because that wasn't part of what, uh, what, what the government did. But now we can do that. And, and I, I believe that ELA provides an absolutely unique experience for students. You've got a very close, tight concentration of people working on a wide range of issues. Uh, you will get more of an ecosystem perspective working there, I'm sure, than you will anywhere else. And finally, I, I, and I've already talked about this, but I think working with ISD, I'm very excited about the, uh, the opportunity to integrate scientific research with policy makers in, in, with the goal of hopefully finding new and different solutions for the world. And, and it's really, for me, it's been a lot of fun. I think most people get into research because they like learning. I've learned so much in my last few months at ISD. Uh, it's, really, uh, uh, it's really interesting. And, and I guess I'm just gonna end by sort of Emphasizing once again, I, I believe that the universities are crucial to ELA's future. I believe that uh, the kind of research that we do at ELA and is best done at ELA, a lot of it can only be done by universities. I, and I'm really anxious that university researchers be aware of the opportunities, opportunities there are at ELA and I'm hoping to convince universities to uh, become more formally involved with ELA. I also, I want to especially emphasize that I think one of the, the best things about ELA is it's a really great platform for team-based ecosystem research. You look at things like the Metallicus project, there's probably like 20 or 30 principal investigators from all around North America. And, and each of them brings their own specialized expertise so that uh, the, 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 the whole product that comes from that project is much greater than any individual piece. And, and that's why the research at ELA has had such an impact is because we, we can lever that up in a way that it is very hard to do in, other, in many other places. So, I, I mean, for me, the reason I, I've been fighting for this for the last year and a half is because I do believe ELA is so important. Uh, and the, the goal is all about producing the best science, the most useful science for the future. And I, I, I re really, I, anxious, desperate to see it survive, and, and I, I want it to see it do well going forward. I, I want to see it continue to do what's, what it's doing and hopefully do more. And really, uh, this slide is not so much about the, the things I listed here. I, I just sat at the computer before I left with and just, there's so many things that could be done at ELA. And the, the thing that's always fun is when I go to different universities, almost every person that I go and talk to has a new idea for ELA. There's all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's the ongoing studies uh, we have this lake that we've been adding phosphorus to for 45 years. It's still generating useful and important information, lots of unresolved questions. We have a study that we're doing right now uh, where we're diverting water around a lake, which I mentioned. Uh, the Metallicus project is in recovery. Uh, we had another project where we added mimics of genetically modified fish to a lake. The Nano Silver project. The, this data set is very largely unexplored. It's actually almost embarrassing. The, the amount of data in that data set that has not been carefully examined is, is unbelievable. And there's all kinds of information in there. There's lots of new areas of research. Uh, there's a, a never-ending list of potential contaminants, uh, things associated with mining. It hasn't escaped me that the, uh, the Premier mentions the Ring of Fire every time she talks about ELA, <laughs> so <laughs> got that up there. Oil development, oil sands, end pit lakes, habitat restoration. There's all kinds of contaminants associated with pharmaceuticals, concentrated solar power, fracking, uh, when I was at Trent, uh, somebody mentioned microplastics. So there's all kinds of stuff that could be done. We've done a lot of work on hydro development, and Hi Manitoba Hydro has been a big supporter and has indicated they want to continue to do work there. Clean water technology, it's not my area of expertise, but a lot of people have talked to me about it, and I'd love to see some work done there. Cumulative impacts, and this whole area of land water management, terrestrial manipulations, which we haven't traditionally gotten into, now we can do that. Uh, but uh, not with, you know, keeping in mind that we don't have the expertise within the ELA group, and this is why we would rely 
on uh, uh, universities. So that, that's all I had to say uh, about ELA. I did want to thank these organizations. There's many, there's countless people, many of you in the room, that have contributed to getting ELA to where we are now. And it's still not done yet, and there's still a lot to be done. It is more exciting now because we're talking about what can ELA be, rather than just sitting around in a room and talking about how do we tear it down. Uh, but these organizations put money on the table for something that they did not know could, would even succeed. So I am thankful to them. RBC for sure, Thomas Sill, Winnipeg Foundation. Uh, and they're, they're, these are organizations that believed enough in us to, uh, and that we could succeed uh, to support us. So I thank them. Uh, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions. No questions? <laughs> Roland. I just have a quick comment. I, you know, the, the sort of the closure of the ELA it brought out, you, you talked about it at the very beginning, but it, it brought out sediment from the broad society that never, never been seen before. Like, I, I had neighbors on my street come up to me and say, what can I do yeah. to save the ELA? I had someone who looked at my house to rent it while I was on sabbatical. He yeah. told me to say, I need to take some action. You know, this yeah. is really, you know, so I've never seen that before. I haven't either, and, it, and I have to say, I said it earlier, I was completely taken aback. I, I, I can't, the day that ELA was closed, I came home, the next day I got my free press, which is the main newspaper in Winnipeg, and this, the whole front page was a picture of ELA, and it was just sunk in big letters, and I was like, wow. I never, <laughs> I, I cannot believe, because for years I just, we kind of worked away on what we were doing, and I actually never knew that anybody, we always believed in what we did, and we knew it was important, but it, I didn't know that anybody else out there had noticed. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was, uh, that's probably the only silver lining in what has been the worst year and a half of my life. Uh, yeah. But it, it has been. Uh, but it's a position of strength. Uh, yeah, well, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, no, it's been good. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, is that still valid, or has there been any loss or discontinuity? Yeah. Um, uh, we've primarily, I think, preserved the, the, the guts of that data set. Uh, and, and throughout this, IASD has emphasized the need to maintain that data set uh, and keep its integrity uh, for the future. So uh, it's not, we used to sample bi weekly, We're, we've been sampling monthly for the last two summers. Yes, they, they've allowed us to sample. Uh, there, there is definitely, there are going to be some wrinkles in the data, but you know, I, I've worked with these data sets, and uh, there's wrinkles <laughs> in many of the, da the data for the, the lakes. There's months missing, or uh, well, it's, things happen. And, and when you put them in the context of 45 years of change, it, it's okay. I, I, I think that those data sets are, uh, they're going to be fine. Yeah, they are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about kind of the impacts or, or the effect of the impacts that they have on the whole ecosystem. Um, are there examples of taking those findings and you, know, you say they are um, applicable to you know places like in southern Ontario, even if our, our lakes aren't you know pristine and whatnot mm -hmm. down here, um, of taking those findings and kind of applying them and kind of demonstrating Absolutely. Yeah, uh, the work there has been the basis for things like nutrient reductions around the world, for hopefully mercury reductions, things like that. Yes, absolutely. I, I work on reservoirs, building reservoirs. Manitoba Hydro has directly changed their reservoir designs in order to reduce some of the issues that were brought up from, from, from ELA. Well, yeah. And uh, the Great Lakes, too. And right? the Great Lakes, absolutely. Yeah. Phosphorus removal from detergent. Yeah. Acid rain, for sure. Yeah, but before that, the yeah. of phosphorus from detergent it was that one, that, was, that picture that Mike showed has been called the most powerful picture in the technology. Because yeah. of that, I mean, so visual, just brought yeah. it right to the US Congress and said, here, look at this. And they went, oh, yeah. Well, and it's sort of interesting, in the early days, the work at ELA kind of focused on effects. 
uh, demonstrating that this or that had an effect. And I think a, a lot of, and that's still the case, but we've also done a lot of work where we're now directly testing proposed mitigation. Uh, things like, well, in fact, Metallicus, the Mercury study, is a test of that in a sense. And, and as some of the reservoir studies are about flooding uplands versus wetlands and things like that. And, and so they're, they're direct tests of proposed ways to reduce environmental issues. Yeah. 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 In your perspective, what's your biggest fear going forward right now, like in terms of uncertainty? What do you think? What's your biggest fear? What's your biggest fear? My my biggest fear. Oh my God! I I, well, I I cannot tell you how many nights of sleep I have lost over ELA <laughs> and continue to lose. Uh, and, and different and on different nights it's different things. Uh, so, um, my biggest fear. Uh, well, my short term fear right now is that we won't retain a sufficient number of our staff. I'm really worried that everybody. They, I, I'm unhappy about the timing of the, the letters and the way they've been delivered and uh, there's this gap between p when people have to make decisions and when they can potentially come to IASD. So I, I, I had always envisioned that our team would keep moving forward together and I, my worst nightmare is it's going to be just me and, I don't, and that's not what I got into this well, for. I hope not. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, and I, 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 that's true, but, but fears are uh, not necessarily rational. <laughs> uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, I'm afraid that we can't raise the funds. You know, I have to get out and, and figure out how to raise the money to do this. I'm a, I, I'm a, I, I'm afraid that the quality of the research that we can't attract high quality researchers and high quality research and the right type. I guess right type of research is kind of a, a tainted term, maybe, but uh, the kind of research that I think ELA is best suited for. Uh, Oh boy, um, <laughs> I, I could probably I could go on. <laughs> I have lots of fears, but uh, no. And, and this is a very uh, it's a, a turbulent time. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with ELA. The only thing in a, is is that uh, we are now we're we're at a, at a place where we can reinvent ELA. I, and I, everybody that's worked there for any length of time knows that there's a lot of fantastic things about it and it's a really incredible place. But they also know that there's lots more that could have been done and there's been a lot of grumping about different things and a lot of it was related to DFO. Now we can shed that and we can remake ELA and build it into the facility that we think it should be. Uh, and uh, Scott Vaughn, who is now the director or the president of ISD, uh, he's the former uh, environment commissioner for the Auditor General and he's a really fantastic person uh, and he's very big picture. You can put that on the internet. <laughs> anyway. uh, no, but he's really great, and he's given a, he's, he basically it has given us free reign to do what we can to make this as good as possible, and that's the really the key, you know, to uh, to to this is that that we're that we we don't we're not restrained by all these mandate issues and bureaucrats coming and asking me why are you sampling chemistry or anything like that. It, it, we can we can just focus on making good. So. There's been a, there's a lot of, there's a positive side, and I try to try to focus on that and not on all the bad things. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I understand that DFO definitely created restraints. It still gave a more specific direction for the ALA. And are you worried now that you've got so many people contributing that you're going to have too many interests? That you think that you think do you foresee that being an issue? with having everyone having their own interests and their own contributions and worried about their own goals coming out of this? Uh, I hope not. I mean, as I said earlier, all of the research that's been done at ELA was highly collaborative, team-based research. and involved multiple partners. And uh, by and large, I felt all of those team-based projects worked well. And I think historically we've learned a lot about how to do team research. It's partly why I, I, I'm anxious to retain the staff and people and the history because we, we've got a lot of experience with this. So uh, I hope not. You know, I, I, I can't make any assurances, but I, I, I believe that, it, that, that this can be managed well. There, I mean, there are limits. 
to the facility. I mean, we can only sleep 60 people comfortably. So there are things, there, you're gonna have, uh, there will be restrictions. It's not like the whole world can work simultaneously there at the same time. So there's gonna have to be ways that, that this, and if that was my problem, I would be very happy. <laughs> because right now, I just wanna, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm interested in making sure that we have good research of any kind going forward. So I, I think, I, I think that'll be okay. Just one last question. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, there was originally 20 staff, 20 full-time staff. Uh, I think what we have sufficient funding that we're probably going to keep 12. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, a lot of people were, had been there for a long time and would would, have, would retire anyway, and they've expressed an interest in continuing to be associated with ELA uh, on a part-time or contract-type basis. So I think I'm hoping that most of the staff will, in some way or another continue to assist with ELA. The, the, we had uh, essentially the, the 12 that we're looking at keeping are camp manager and assistant. That's the person that keeps the buildings running, the lights on, water flowing, all that sort of stuff. Uh, four scientists, uh, the, the, these are PhDs. Uh, they're the people that by and large write the papers and grant proposals and things like that. Uh, and the expertise, we, the four that we have right now is we have a, a fish population specialist, Mike Rennie. Uh, we have a fish behavioral, a uh, specialist in uh, Paul Blanchfield, there's myself, I've worked primarily with invertebrates and zooplankton and plankton in general, and Scott Higgins, who works with primary production. Um, and and uh, we used to have a biogeochemist, this is Ray Hessline, who retired, uh, and I, I feel it's essential that we keep that, and I'm looking to uh, getting some biogeochemical expertise going forward. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then there's a, for, a, te a technical staff yeah. I'll equip it. I think we should probably draw this to a close. Yeah. And I want to thank Mike for this very oh, yeah. frank and open discussion for the future of the ELA. I mean, you deliver the legacy. I mean, if a place can have an H index, the H index of ELA is actually 116, believe it or not. So, amazing <laughs> legacy. What comes out to the public is, of course, these lakes, but what comes out in the science is, is, is tremendous. And so, not only the legacy you delivered, but now you've delivered us the sort of the the new opportunities, the fantastic opportunities that oh, are available. Sorry. So this is a small token of oh, our geez. appreciation for that conversation. <laughs> okay. I should and be offering you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>